Goeie middag iedereen. Welkom Good afternoon, deze everyone, and welcome to this in session met de EU Green that we do in cooperation van Publiek Groenstaat. With we zullen het meer bepaald Europe hebben over het pesticidebeheer we'll ervan. Pesticide free management. En dat doen we met adelheid van Hille we'll van de Vlaamse Milieumaatschappij en of the Vanja Flemish Environmental Agency. Zij zullen and vandaag Tanya ervaring from the delen Korean services. They will over de share their experiences concerning the transition of the Flemish public spaces. First, Daniel Termont will explain the philosophy of green spaces in the city, and we will get more information on the transition to a pesticide-free town. But what Pan Europe does. In deze we will first Heel explain what Pan Europe do. First of all, we've launched campaigns op drie verschillende pijlers. that are based Allereerst, on three um, is er een aspects. Aspect first of all, there's a policy aspect in which we try to find verandert. how we can change a policy en in a positive way. Onder andere over België, Duitsland, Nederland, Belgium, Luxemburg, Germany, Luxemburg, Luxemburg, Frankrijk. France. Denmark en we and volgen France. op wat er beleidsmatig gebeurt in Europa op and vlak van monitor, pesticidenvrije initiatieven. In Daarnaast Europe. hebben we ook een gids ontwikkeld The, die als leidraad voor steden dient, guide, waarin pioniers het hoe en het waarom van hun transitie aankaarten. The, en ten slotte brengen we ook fysiek in kaart wat er precies gebeurt. We also physically uh, map out what is happening. statistieken op basis we van de resultaten van onze enquêtes die toelaten om inzicht um, en overzicht te krijgen hoe het ervoor staat op het lokale niveau. En what is going anderzijds on doen we ook een mapping oefening we are also trying to met een landkaart die inspirerende pioniersteden aanduidt en een zoekfunctie die toelaat om na te gaan of een stad al dan niet pesticidevrij is. Het overkoepelende doel daarvan is een basis leggen voor het debat rond pesticidegebruik. Um, en net op basis van die informatie rond de woordtrekkers en hoe ze bepaalde obstakels weten te overwinnen, we can see om how uitwisseling zowel op regionaal als internationaal vlak uh, te stimuleren. We zijn onze campagne dan ook heel bewust gestart we om de voortschrijdende transitie in Europese steden aan te moedigen en te ondersteunen. En we zien ook dat dat zijn vruchten afwerkt. We zien uh, dat andere NGO's ook campagnes Other opstarten, NGOs in onder andere have, have Duitsland, Frankrijk, Groot-Brittannië en Portugal. Uh, het doel van deze campagne is om Now, the um, in dit stadium dan ook best practices naar voren te schuiven, om kennis uit te wisselen en om een zo efficiënt mogelijk leerproces te creëren, to wat create niet enkel onnodige kosten vermijdt, maar ook interregionale samenwerking op dat vlak bevordert. Nu laat ik graag verder het woord over aan Daniel International Termont, Cooperation. de minister van Gent, like die ons het Daniel hoe en waarom van de Gentse transitie zal toelichten. Uh, why there is a transition in Dames en heren, goeiedag. Gent heeft een klein, vrij klein, maar een fantastisch stadcentrum. Maar Gent is wel bijna 16.000 hectare groot. Ongeveer 30.000 voetbalvelden dus. Ongeveer de helft daarvan is open ruimte. Die groene ruimte heeft een groot potentieel als natuurgebied. Onze stedelijke groendienst onderhoudt ongeveer 1000 hectare. Dat gaat om, tussen aanleidingstekens, normale zaken zoals parken, natuurgebieden en begraafplaatsen. Maar dat gaat ook om wegbermen, talus langs waterlopen en verkeersgroen. Die duizend hectare is niet min. We beheren ze al jarenlang op een natuurvriendelijke manier, passend binnen onze totaalvisie om van Gent een duurzame, leefbare stad te maken. Dan is het logisch dat pesticiden daar absoluut niet bij horen. Want pesticiden zijn en blijven vergif. Ze verstoren het planten- en dierenleven. Ze verontreinigen onze bodem en het water. Ze bedreigen zelfs de gezondheid van de bewoners. Van sommige pesticiden wordt aangenomen dat ze kankerverwekkende eigenschap hebben en hormoonverstorend werken. Die willen we absoluut niet in ons drinkwater. Het gebruik van pesticiden in het openbaar groen is pas sinds 1 januari 2015 echt verboden, maar wij zijn er al langer van afgestapt. Onze groendienst begon al in het begin van de jaren 90 met de afbouw van haar pesticidengebruik. De start kwam er vanuit de basis. Het was een onderhoudsploeg in Nieuw-Gent, een van de 25 wijken in onze stad, die dan op dat ogenblik op een andere manier ging gaan begeren. 
In de plaats van te proberen bodems onder struiken kaal te houden met pesticiden, lieten ze soms vegetaties spontaan groeien. Ongewenste kruiden werden verwijderd. Gewenste, vaak mooie, bloeiende planten mochten blijven staan. Het resultaat was echt schitterend. Ze merkten dat er meer vogels op afkwamen. Ze kregen nog positieve reacties ook van de buurtbewoners. En ondertussen deden de tuiniers zelf ook heel wat extra plantenkennis op. Langzaam werd die aanpak gemeengoed in de hele groendienst. Sinds 1997 werden jaar na jaar minder pesticiden ingezet. In 2003 stelde de stad een reductieprogramma op. En in 2009 besliste het college van burgemeesterschap van onze stad om helemaal geen pesticiden meer te gebruiken. Onze pesticidenvrij beheer kwam er dus niet van vandaag op morgen. Zo'n transitie vraagt om een duidelijke, toekomstgerichte keuze voor een ander soort paden en parken. Het vraagt om een overgangsbegeer, waarbij onkruidbranders en schoffels moeten worden ingezet. Het vraagt om de zoektocht naar de beste werkwijze en om afstemming tussen ontwerpers, aanleggers en onderhoudsmensen. Het vraagt ook om sensibilisatie en vorming van het eigen personeel en ook om sensibilisatie van de inwoners. Pas vandaag, ongeveer twintig jaar later na de start, is onze pesticidenvrije aanpak de enige methode die we nu nog gebruiken. Het resultaat is nu in de hele stad echt zichtbaar. Doordat we geen chemische bestrijdingsmiddelen meer gebruiken, is er in de straten beduidend meer groen te zien. Er staan klaprozen, boterbloemen en madeliefjes aan de rand van onze trottoirs. Bijen bijvoorbeeld hadden het tot voor kort heel lastig om in onze stad te overleven. Vandaag geeft Gent enkele imkers die in de stad een gezonde omgeving vinden om hun bijen te kweken. En zo wordt Gent steeds groener, gezonder en leefbaarder voor iedereen. Niet alleen voor de mensen die zich een huis met een grote tuin kunnen permitteren. Onze scheep van Openbaar Groen, de heer Tom Balthazar, heeft daar een mooie uitspraak over. Hij zegt, de parken, dat zijn eigenlijk de tuinen van de Gentenaars. Vandaag, dames en heren, hoeft niemand nog schrik te hebben dat onze kinderen ziek zouden worden door in een park te spelen. En daar doen we het vooral om. En ik hoop dat onze aanpak hier in de stad Gent andere steden mede zal inspireren. Bedankt voor uw aandacht. Good afternoon, my name is Tanya. I work for the city of Ghent, and I'm going to talk to you about the pesticide-free policy in Ghent. So this isn't something that happened overnight. We began in 1997. We had an environment compact that was approved, which said that the community was going to start reducing its pesticide use, and we applied for temporary grants in order to do that. What did this involve? Well, we committed for an environmentally friendly uh, weed removal policy. We made an inventory of our pesticide use. We also carried out an action plan evaluating our pesticide use and raising awareness among the services about the alternatives available. What was the result of that? Well, we uh, this led to an 80% fall in pesticide reduce compared with the initial level in 97. From 2003 onwards, we uh, had the approval of a pesticide reduction decree. This meant that we were committed by the 1st of June 2003 to putting in place a reduction plan. Here you can see an overview of the pesticide use from 1992 all the way up to 2013. We we're using about 1,000 uh, kilograms of active substances in 1999, but this was a reduced uh, a great deal. We've uh, reduced this over the course of 15 years down to zero. Just a couple of statistics about Ghent. We have about 250,000 inhabitants. Uh, we have a surface area of around 15,790 hectares, and these are managed by the environmental services. We're talking about 320 members of staff, 262 of which are uh, full-time or the equivalent thereof. How did we split up these tasks? 
in order to achieve zero pesticide use. So there are a lot of things involved here. Firstly, we separated out the task between the different services of the council. There is, for example, IVAGO, which is the Public Safety Authority, and the uh, transport services as well. All of these different departments are involved in the reduction of pesticide use. So what does this task distribution lead to? Well, it results in clarity for who has to keep which areas weed-free. For example, the environmental services, the green services, as they're known, uh, were taking care of footpaths and other green areas, and the other city services were taking, par uh, taking care of parks, car parks, and sports grounds. It's also important to remember that there was a police uh, regulation that says that Residents of Ghent themselves had to keep the footpaths before their own dwellings clear of weeds, but they could not use pesticides for this purpose. Another important point is how the principles were put into place. We have a holistic park and green spaces management uh, set of principles. And this uh, is an attempt to ensure a balance between people and the environment. And this has to be taken into account in our plans. So when it comes to changing our methods, we can no longer use certain methods to cut down uh, plants or weeds. We instead have to scythe or choose for uh, choose to allow certain vegetation to grow spontaneously and weed them selectively. We can allow grass to grow over the bottoms of trees or we can also plant shoots. And this is a, a green way of managing the area. Here is an example of an area in Ghent where trees were planted and we planted shrubbery at the base to avoid uh, this problem of weeds springing up. But here you can see that there are plants which have been allowed to grow spontaneously and we haven't removed these. Now let's move on to plant beds and rose borders. This is in the Citadel Park in Ghent. You can see uh, a lot of roses here. And usually we don't uh, replant these. Instead we allow other plants to grow in between. Ground cover plants that don't strangle the roses. And once the roots have grown deep enough, this makes sure that the roses aren't going to be damaged during hoeing or sweeping and it also ensures that the roses don't produce so many thorns. We have here another example of rose borders with ground cover plants. Here is another example of a border which is maintained uh, by sweeping and we also have a number of set plants here that are uh, planted. This is another image of the Citadel Park and a photo of how things can look afterwards. This is a new park in Ghent where we have planted new shrubbery and the uh, ground cover plants have also been sown here. This allows for these plants to, to grow This is another example of a border with certain types of shrubs and we have allowed plants to grow here. We don't maintain it any further than this, so we're not going to mow this area unless it becomes much too unruly. In that case, we will selectively mow the area, but we want to avoid this as much as possible to avoid damaging the plants. This is an example of an area which is weeded selectively. We've allowed 
plants to grow spontaneously. And we also have to make a choice about which plants we want to leave and which we want to remove. In the middle of this photo, you can see a cycle path and two rows of trees on either side. This is an area where we used to remove weeds by spraying them, but now we allow vegetation to grow spontaneously around the bases of the trees. This is another example of a row of trees where we used to have pavement, it used to be surfaced, but you can also allow grass to grow in this area and uh, mow it from time to time. You can see here another example of a tree base which has been planted around and you can again choose which plants you want to allow to grow here and which ones you want to remove. We also used a number of alternative management techniques uh, and we also implemented prevention techniques as well. Hoeing and weeding are very well known and these are logical procedures both on the surfaces and on the grassy areas themselves. We don't really tend to use the word weeds really but we use the word undesirable plants and we have made a great use of this weed brushing machine uh, which is very well known. It's not so much um, used at the moment but it's a, a quick procedure. There are other procedures that we've used as well. We use sweeping machines in the Citadel Park, for example. We also use heating machines to heat the undesirable plants. But this is a technique which is also dying out, so to speak, because it it takes a long time to treat every plant and the result is a little less than what we hoped for. Here you see a machine which rips up the weeds and they are then burned. So that tiller is another one of our methods and it's best to combine as many different methods as possible. You can see here there's a burner, a hoe, um, a tiller to remove the weeds which are then burned or taken away. And we combine all these different methods. But uh, to be honest we do also do a lot of mowing, mowing at the bases of trees. So this is an example of a mower. But we also use these in forest areas as well. And this is one of the quickest methods available. What are our preventative measures then? Well, firstly, we do a lot of sweeping. We use machines in order to do this. And we also call upon our colleagues from the public services, they have these special road sweeping machines which we can use, for example, in the Citadel Park. There are several paths, several kilometers worth of footpaths which are swept several times a year with these machines and this prevents the need for uh, chemical substances because It uh, allows undesirable plants to be removed. There are also um, design measures which need to be taken into account. We try to plant things at a lower level. This means that the tree can remain in the center of the planted area. This is another example in New Ghent, an area in Ghent. The choice of surfacing is also very important. Concrete is one example and uh, no maintenance is required on these kinds of surfaces but you can also choose 
a surface which allows certain plants to get through and provides a more natural environment. Here's an example of a not so successful design choice. The idea was to plant several different trees in places where the people walk you see no weeds but elsewhere you can and uh, or you could say well this is not such a big deal but there were questions about whether this was really the right choice in the most natural environment you can also choose uh, additional material in which you allow grass to grow but you might want to choose something which allows you to still mow it we worked with our colleagues uh, from transport services on this topic and they also suggested using sand to fill in cracks. So we have to think about the joints there. This, uh, there's also the option of an unmaintained um, finish. And we also need to make sure that we have a gradual and ongoing approach. What do I mean by that? Well, firstly, the idea, the idea is not to change everything in one go. People who are involved in carrying out maintenance activities need to uh, be able to understand this and join in this transition. That means that in the first few years, after changing the nature of the vegetation that's used, we need to make sure that this is uh, kept up and carried out regularly after the plants have grown in they need to be checked once to twice a year and possibly maintained and then you need to make sure that you go step by step and uh, implement an ongoing continuous policy finally it can take years sometimes to break down uh, layers of vegetation which have grown Awareness is also an important point and training for employees. We try to encourage change and we try to encourage initiative. So it doesn't have to always come from the top. People who are carrying out maintenance activities should also feel free to take the initiative themselves and to put processes in place. After all, they have the most experience with this. We need a general uh, training service such as elementary uh, basic plant knowledge uh, maintaining grassland and so on and what's also important is that as a service we try to make sure that we provide internal training for our employees and for the green services it's a train the trainer principle we need ongoing monitoring for example we allow employees um, from the green services to meet employees from other services and they can uh, teach one another. Last year, for example, we had a training session all about invasive exotic species and there are other topics too. So we need ongoing monitoring when it comes to weeds and we have a weeds working party that discusses the topic, uh, meeting on a regular basis they discuss topics such as how to keep footpaths weed free and so on and uh, the maintenance techniques to be used. Here are a few photos of people uh, during our internal training activities. That was the training session on grassland management. Finally, we also need to inform the citizen and make citizens aware. How do we do that? We want to motivate people to get behind our zero pesticides policy. On this photo, you can see a picture of a cemetery. There were previously footpaths and these were all broken up and sown over with grass. It's important for people to know why that's happening. People need to know that it's not going to be mown as frequently, that the management isn't going to be as intensive as beforehand. So signs were set up to tell people about the changes that were taking place in the cemetery. And uh, people were made aware that there are always alternatives. 
it's important to emphasize the beauty of pesticide-free management and not the disadvantages. Why do I say that? Well, here you have a photo of a site which is next to one of the main museums in Ghent. Beiloka is its name. You can see the wildflower meadow here with uh, poppies and other flowers. We also mow a border between the wild vegetation and grass here. It's perhaps not so easy to see on the uh, photo, but you have, in any case, a, a border. And next to this edge, you have plants that are chosen and placed there deliberately because we really select which ones to, to allow to grow and which ones to remove. So there's a clear distinction between intensive maintenance and uh, non-intensive maintenance. Moreover, we're also advocating tolerance for weeds in the city in general. Here, it's clear that we need to develop this. We need to develop tolerance for weeds. You could actually say, look, this is a, um, a beautiful thing. These plants are to be welcomed. Here you can see plants growing around a, an artwork, and that's just part of the concept, because these plants are beautiful as well. Here you can see the content information for our department, and I am available to answer further questions. Thank you. Pesticiden vrij is, um, dat ze het asfalt wil gaan uitbreken om er gras te leggen en zo. Allemaal fantastisch. Um, super ook om zelf inspiratie op te doen voor in mijn eigen tuintje. Um, dus voilà, ik um, ben een blij burger. Wat ik ook zie is dat de, dat de oude planten worden vervangen door, door nieuwe, lokale, duurzame planten. En uh, die boomblekkers die zorgen ervoor dat het, het, het onkruid er ook niet meer doorkomt. Um, ja, dit is allemaal een, een, een fantastische stap voorwaarts. Dus Citadelpark, vroeger, ik herinner me nog, waar wij woonden in de buurt, kwamen ze met twintigtal mensen van stad, het onkruid verdagen, buspuiten en wat weet ik wat allemaal. Nu vind ik het zeer goed dat dat allemaal van de baan is en dat nu gras mag groeien. En dat onkruid ook een plant is die niet altijd moet verdeeld worden. Dus positief dat er nu een andere richting is ingegaan. Hallo, ik ben een van de leerlingen van de internationale school in Ghent. En we zijn hier met de kinderen in het Citadel Park. And I'm very happy to know that this is an organic park because we I allow the children to play and run freely on the grass. And I would be very worried if I knew there were pesticides on the grass. So it's lovely. Uh, you can see the children are having a wonderful time here playing. And uh, it's. I hope there's more parks like this in Ghent because I really I wouldn't want to go anywhere else with the children. I jumped aboard a pirate ship and the captain said to me, Go with the sweet apple, just hold them back with over the eye of the sea. Go with the sweet apple, just hold them back with over the eye of the sea. When I was five, I ran to die, and the day I went to sea. I jumped aboard a pirate ship and the captain said to me, We go with the sweet apple, just hold them back. Hallo, ik ben Eva. En dan gaan we nu over naar uh, het live debat. Deel. To the live debate of this webinar. I will introduce our new, or I will give the floor to our new participants. I'm Jan Blomme. I'm responsible for the daily maintenance of the Citadel Park. I'm Koen Dirix. I'm responsible for part of Gen City, of the maintenance. 
and I lead, in fact, our management team and maintenance teams. And now we go on to the questions. Harriet Williams asks, is there a network in between institutions on the management? I would like to answer this myself. Not as far as we know. There is an exchange on an international level in between member states concerning the uh, Directive on Sustainable Use of Pesticides. But creating a network is the objective of our campaign. In a starting phase, we emphasize on awareness and on explaining what is really happening. And we first start with the uh, exchange of knowledge. And we will, of course, check if there is support on a European level. Next question. The costs of such a transition are often an obstacle. But what, impl what does these costs mean? And where can we get an extra budget? When developing a new Flemish legislation in 2013, we've calculated the costs. There was a survey for the extra costs. And it was very unclear if there were extra costs. <laughs> and sometimes there were more costs and other times less. So, we just explained that we can manage on, in a different way and then these costs might be lower. Maybe some additions. Indeed, I think on the long term the costs will be less because you have to purchase less instruments. It's more a progressive process and progressive approach. So, we will not have a completely different management overnight. It's a process that takes a lot of time, where you have to train people. We've always already said that you have to change the design, change materials, get more knowledge and so on. At the beginning, when we were talking about these perennial plants, we always already had the idea training people is m needs or requires more effort. But now, when you work closely, you see that you only have the advantages of it. Next question. How do you communicate to the citizens and what which advice would you give to a city that's only starting with it? I think it's very important to clearly communicate to the citizens. This is what we've done. And it shouldn't be once, it needs to be annually to highlight the context and the story. Sometimes we launch press releases for our city magazine. We have a regional television, television channel in which we highlight specific themes and topics and on sensitive locations, we are going to explain what is happening, why the management has changed. There was a question of Zoe Luic from Serbia. How do you convince authorities that are not convinced of the initiative? In Serbia, for example, it's the Ecoseed lobby. Maybe you can look at our PowerPoint presentation. It's a good start. The image needs to, to sell. And uh, an image of a shrub that is being killed by pesticides and then another shrubbery that is flourishing. I think that speaks everything. I agree, I agree. The beautiful images that you have shown in the presentation should convince people and that way We see that 
new, more green, greener locations are created. And I think it's an added value for everyone. On top of that, these people are very welcome to come to Ghent to be guided in our city. Tim Ede from Brussels asks, what are the biggest concerns for of citizens who are in this transitioning phase? We in Flanders like it to be clean. And if you take a look at other countries, this cleanliness is less. I think in other countries it's much more easier to take the step to a pesticide-free management. If you take a look at the supermarkets, you see so such a wide offer to cleaning products. So we here in Flanders, especially the elderly, like everything to be clean. So the story about convincing people that we can change the situation, that we can get another image, which is better for our environment and ourselves, is, I think, very important. I notice that for most people who live in the city center in the 19th century, that they didn't really have complaints about alternatives, alternative management. We didn't really have complaints. More, uh, the complaints we get are more about illegal dumping, not really about herbs that are growing on undesired locations. I must say, my experience teaches me in a classical park where we killed everything with all kinds of servicing. They told us, well, we need to stop using these products. And I thought, well, what reaction will we get? All complaints went to our direction. They have supported us always. And now for years, we all only get positive reactions. Are there organizations that provide consulting to start management without pesticides? So you have experience with it? In Flanders, we have the Association for Public Green that supports municipalities. For citizens, we have Felt, which is a non-profit organization. And there are a lot of other research uh, companies, research companies that have expertise. Other municipalities have a lot of knowledge to tell this story. We have the benefit that we are a large city and we have a large service. And therefore, we have a lot of knowledge that is shared by a lot of people, but also the interaction in between people who make policy and people who have to execute this policy is very important. We need to listen to each other. We need to share the knowledge of people on site and to bring that information to the people on top. How can citizens actively engage in this process? We listen to their stories, they share information, but they're not really give much advice. It's more our service who is um, telling us what to do and we just follow this guideline. Of course, a citizen can have a supporting function for policy. If they would like a more a greener policy, he needs to show this. And I think it's very, very simple, just to vote on the right people to spread this story. In some cases, we listen explicitly to the citizen, for example, to, to teachers, pupils, parents in specific schools. Schools want to make their playing ground greener, and therefore we are putting in place projects where we grow plants and uh, do the gardening ourselves. Also for the future, citizens would like to take more initiative, for example, in front of their home to plant herbs, trees, vegetables, for example, flower mixes in our service. There is also 
an initiative of planting trees, but we see that the citizen really wants to engage and really wants to cooperate interactively to a greener citizen, a city. It's also a kind of awareness. Without is healthier, which is the slogan in Dutch. So it's this awareness of making, of telling that a healthier environment is better. And in this society in which, in which we live right now, everything needs to go fast. And therefore, people really like to change. They like authenticity. The landscape on the countryside, for example, seeing flowers, it's a dream that we would like to realize again, to have again in our city, green for everyone. Public space is very scarce. And therefore, we need to have a lot of functions. We need to use it for different purposes. We've already sent, said this, a harmonic park project is very important. We need to make sure that it can fulfill all purposes. What were the largest technical challenges at the beginning of this transition to a pesticide-free management where there are some kinds, types of species that cause problems, plants, species, for example. In the beginning, we had to look how we should do it. We've applied uh, herbs and plants. In the beginning, we made a couple of mistakes. We've planted invasive species, for example. But now we have so many knowledge and we're not making those mistakes again. But we're still alert also for plants that are growing spontaneously. We're all, always eradicating invasive species and then we're taking a look at what we can do and what we can't. Important here is to grow the right plant on the right place and to have as much biodiversity as possible. In the beginning, we only used one or a couple of species on a large surface. And this implies that you have a kind of monoculture. And eventually, other herbs will grow as well. And that is why we try to mix as much as possible to get a more diverse composition of plants. And therefore, we try to have different layers as well because that is better for insects, for birds, for to get their feed, food and to find nourishment. It's, it's better for birds, for example, to have a larger diversity. The richer the composition, the better. It's in fact like nature. So a question about the cost now. Is it more expensive to provide training on alternatives, alternative methods to pesticides? Do you have uh, anything to say about that? Well, I think that's very important anyway, that you, you have a training about uh, botanical knowledge, about how to use certain machines, how you can manage green spaces most effectively. This connects very well to our topic. You need to be trained, otherwise you just can't carry out these tasks. That's a, a part of your normal training, I think. I can tell you that what's free, that's making people aware of fauna and flora and the things that are around them. And so that when they see a plant, they will enjoy that plant for what it is, that means that they're less likely to, to uh, come to a park and complain about certain things. We need to encourage people to, to come into a park and be able to identify a park, uh, a plant. And this is something which many people are motivated. If the public, if the audience have any questions, then please send them to us now, because this is the time we have 
come to the end of our questions we received previously, you can also send us questions via Facebook, Twitter or email at this point. While we wait, we will just take a short break. Anna Maria Slava from Ljubljana has sent us a question. What have the biggest challenges been for Ghent up to now when it comes to the zero pesticide policy? Personally, what I've found a major challenge in a classical traditional park is that there are lots of ornaments, there are lots of monuments and the main challenge was to introduce a zero pesticide policy in a short length of time. Yes, I'd also like to link up to that. The Citadel Park in Ghent is a park from the Romantic period. There are a lot of ornamental areas. It's based on an English garden style. There are lots of special uh, types of plants which were brought in that needed a certain type of maintenance earlier. We needed to keep the ground very clear. Nothing else could grow there. You couldn't even walk on the grass. So there were special measures. But now every square meter is used or has been at least taken in hand. And it's a challenge to change the uh, maintenance of this park, which is in a romantic style. It's a challenge to transform it into a park which can still be used now and to implement this transition. There was an example shown earlier where we had rose bushes which were surrounded with a ground cover layer of vegetation which actually help um, the growth of the roses and which produce a better result than earlier. So that's certainly a major challenge. I think that there's a still another even greater challenge which lies before us and that's involving citizens in this whole story and garnering their support. I think that's my, that's my personal view that that's our greatest challenge that lies ahead. But this is something uh, which we can't um, take for granted. Uh, something else which was a major challenge for our department was the cemeteries, making them greener and making them more environmentally friendly. We had a lot of feedback from citizens regarding this approach that really wanted to stick to a traditional intensive uh, maintenance approach. So that's our major challenge. That's what we're working on at the moment. Thank you. Have any other problems come up? which don't involve undesirable plants. In Merken we have a park where lots of children are working around and there are um, thistles, there are weeds which can sting and we need to make sure that uh, these are removed by selective weeding. And earlier, you had everything removed from the park. So people have noticed that there are young trees springing up there, young chestnut trees, um, tree shoots. 
these things can be mown. We also have scythes and everything is kept back, is cut back by scythe. What about herbicides? Do they have to be do they do only herbicides have to be replaced or are there alternatives for other pesticides too? Well we don't use any more herbicides. Nature repairs itself in a natural way over the course of time we notice that this problem solves itself so really it's just an issue of getting support from the citizens i think that when you are selecting plants you have to take a close look uh, and make sure that they're easy to maintain without pesticides a good example is that of roses we now have varieties that are resistant to mold, to diseases, and various um, different attacks. And we need to bear this in mind. Certainly in Flanders, there's the buxus moth, which affects the buxus plants. And that's not uh, a plant that is original to this country. It doesn't grow so easily. So the choice of plant, we have to make sure if it's resistant to insects that might um, prey on these plants. So plant selection, as my colleague said previously, we need the right plant in the right place. Is it strong? Is it sturdy enough? Is it susceptible to diseases? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves. Another question has come in. What do you think is the role of NGOs in this transition towards pesticide-free cities? How can they support this transition. Well, personally, I work for the Flemish government. And the Flemish government works together with VELT. That's an NGO that is a, a citizens movement. And we also work together with the Public Green Association they support us too, so we can support each other. We uh, publicize, we publish things, uh, articles in their journals, and we also work with them on adding interesting information to our website. I don't see any further questions. I'll just wait for a moment. Paula Quercus from Portugal. Is asking about the mindset and the uh, image that people have of weeds. How can these be transformed via actions carried out by citizens? How can citizens themselves work to change these attitudes? I think sharing knowledge, sharing knowledge about weeds. We keep saying weeds, but uh, as someone said earlier, we don't like to use this word. We talk about undesirable plants. We should talk about the useful properties that some of these weeds or undesirable plants can have. There's been a lot written about the healing properties of certain plants. Some plants can be used in uh, cooking, and I think that there's a lot of information out there, but we could make more information available about different plant categories. And people will start to look at these plants in a different way, and they will also have more tolerance towards them. They'll start to get the idea in their heads that uh, the agriculture we had before, where we didn't have to remove weeds, uh, is still a valid one. There are plants which are really beautiful to look at, but they're considered weeds. And they have a lot of different and interesting properties. So you, sometimes you don't have to cut down these plants, but you, you have to just work with them and live with them. And we can look at the role of the uh, 
at plants that are in our parks, if we don't have ground cover plants, we might find that um, it can be more beautiful to, to allow them to grow. So it's looking at plants in a different way by providing them with information and by informing them a lot more. This can be done in local areas. You can have presentations, brochures and so on. In the clip that we saw earlier on by Daniel Termont, the mayor, he was speaking about beekeepers. And in Ghent, there are so many plants now that beekeepers have actually been able to establish themselves here and to keep bees. And they can produce honey from their hives. So I think that this is a fantastic example of what a pesticide fee policy in a city can achieve. Do you have any other examples of citizens' actions in Ghent that have sprung up in a spontaneous way since you implemented your pesticide-free policy? Do you have any ideas about that? Well, in their own local area, people can ask to maintain a certain green area. This happens in a very simple way in our local area. Uh, people can remove litter, they can maintain um, traffic signposts and so on, or they can form a group with people living in their area with neighbours and they can decide to plant on certain uh, corners or little areas. We have uh, someone who implemented this policy and started it off. There are bigger groups as well that decide to maintain larger areas of parkland and there are various different initiatives out there. But of course, we only support these measures if we're involved from the beginning. We ask people for their initiatives. We then speak to the residents and see what we can do together with them. OK, well, I think we're going to bring this webinar to an end. Thank you very much for being here. And we look forward to the follow-up from this. Thank you for attending.